Welcome again. My name is Marcelo. I'm the tech lead for the Place API. I work on the, as part of the Maps API team in Sydney. And we're going to be talking today about writing location-based apps using Google APIs. So this is the feedback page for the session. And also, if you're tweeting about how awesome your next location-based app is going to be, this is the hashtag you want to use. Uh, so yeah, we, most of the Maps API team is based in Sydney. Uh, we're pretty proud of that. And I've got a few stickers here with a cool Maps API marker and the Aussie flag. So you guys can take it after the session. So this is the agenda for today. And I'm going to give you a quick intro about what the Place API is about. Um, then I'm going to go over each of the main features of the API, alternating between live demos and code samples. Um, it's going to be a bit dry, because I really want to show you how you use the API. So I'm going to be using uh, shell commands. Be prepared. And then I'm going to hand over to Yanni from Scavenger. He's going to be telling us about his experience using the API from an engineering perspective. So instead of telling what the API is, I'm going to show you a quick demo. So one really cool feature of the Place API is the suggest feature. So I can start typing here, say, the Moscone Center. So it shows up really quickly as one of our first suggestions. Or I could try, say, go a little bit further. Australia, you see that it's actually ranked lower. That's because I'm looking at San Francisco. So he's, he's bias, it's biasing results within the viewport. So if I choose Australia, so there I am. Now I can go Sydney, right at the top. Piermont. Google Sydney. So that's where our office is. So you see, really, really quick, I went from looking at, you know, zooming right in into, from the Moscone Center into the Google office halfway around the world. And here, I, I'll do a place search. So it returns me a couple of results. Some of them are what we call geocodes, um, things like suburbs, um, locality, cities, and also local listings. So Google Sydney is here. I click on the listing, and I show some details about the listing. So Signora Ali Gastronomia, so on and so forth. So that's, that's the idea behind the, the API. So give you an easy access to places in general, be it business listings, or be it a, a geocode, a suburb, a point of interest in general. So how do you do this? So the API has two, there, there are two main ways to access the API. One is via the JS API, and the other one is via the web service. Just a quick show of hands here. Uh, how many of you use the Maps API? How many of you use the Maps API v3? How many of you have ever used a library? All right, maybe 15, 20%. Uh, so for those that don't know, a library on Maps API v3 allows us to add non-core functionality to the API without add, adding bulk to the binary. Uh, so places is, is one, one more of those libraries. So when you specify in the bootstrap request, an extra module will be downloaded with the API. And all places API symbols will be available inside the Google Maps places namespace.
You also have to set the sensor flag um, to either true or false, depending where you're getting your location signal from. So the other way to use the API is via the, the web service. So how many of you were thinking of uh, writing a native app running maybe on a, okay. So if, if you want to write a native app, you probably will be using the HTTP service. And it offers both JSON and XML endpoints. You have to sign up for a key in the developer's console. It's really easy. It gives you a key, API key. You set the API key, whichever you request, as I'm doing here in the example. And you also pass the sensor, the sensor flag again, either true or false, depending where the, the location is coming from. So here, I'll show you just what happens if you try to send a request without a key. The same request now with the key set gets this back. So if you look at my request, I specify the location and the radius. Right, so I'm doing a 200 meters search around the specific location. And what I get back is uh, response status and a list of places in the array called results. So it's very straightforward actually. So place search. So this is another demo. So whenever I drag the map, it redoes, reissues the search. If I zoom in, reissues again. So you see it's always return, returning 20 results, plus maybe uh, two or three geocodes. The results are ranked uh, based on, on a Google specific ranking but we're gonna see, see later in the, in the session that when you do check-ins, you can actually uh, have an impact on that ranking. So how do you do that search? So since most of you, most of you are, uh, look more interested in using it from the JavaScript perspective, this is how you do it. So you declare a request object providing a location and a radius. The location is a, is a lat long. You instantialize, um, instantiate a place, place service object, and you provide either a map or uh, a div of your own. And the reason we need that is because we need to display the, all the attributes, the copyrights from the list that we're gonna return. So if you provide a map, the copyright will appear uh, together with the attributes of the map. Then you, sh you call search on the places object, giving, providing the request, and then a callback function. And the callback function will be called and the results come back from the, from the place API. And it's gonna contain an array of places in the results array, and also the response status. So here I'm ignoring the response status, it shouldn't do that when you actually try to use this. But what I'm doing is um, I'm going through all the, the entries in the array and adding a marker. And then you can see when I create the marker, I use the geometry.location property on the place to set the position. I use the name as the title of the marker. I use the icon as the custom, custom image for the marker. So, really easy. So if you're using the JSON, sorry, the, the web service interface, you're gonna call the Maps API search, either JSON or XML endpoints, depending on what you're more comfortable dealing with. Pass a location, a radius, and I didn't put it there, but also the, the key and the sensor key and the sensor flag. 
So you, we've seen what the result look like. So it's going to be a list of a list of places. And these are the attributes that come come back on a search result. So you get name, you get vicinity, which is a way to disambiguate two results if they're the same. So you have two two Starbucks um, on the within your search radius. Be, the name of the street will be used to, you can provide that to your user so he can tell the two Starbucks apart. A list of types, which are the categories that are assigned to that listing, and a geometry and an icon so that you can use the icon and to display your results. So this is a thin slice of the types that we support. I just wanted to give you an idea of how, how the API treats types. So it's actually a, a hierarchy of types. And usually a place is assigned to one of those leaf nodes, sometimes more than one. It could be, say, a, caf a cafe and a restaurant, a bar and a restaurant at the same time. But when you get the results back, you don't get just the, the leaf node. You get the leaf node and all the parents node of that leaf. So if it's a bar, you're going to get bar food establishment, right? And if it's a neighborhood, you're going to get neighborhood political. And the icon is also attached to each of those types. So if you have a specific icon for the leaf node, that's what you're going to return. Uh, otherwise, you're going to return the, the first icon that shows up up the tree. So in this, in this example, if I'm returning shoe, shoe store, because I don't have a specific icon for shoe store, I'll just return you the icon for store. So as I said, this is really a tiny slice of the class that we support. And if you look at the, our documentation, we list more than 100 different, different types. And you can use those types uh, in two places. You can use them f when you filter in search. We're going to see that later, how you, do, how you do filtering by type. And you can also use it when you're adding your, your own places. There's actually uh, a difference here. There's, at the bottom of the list, there are some types that you, you can't add. So currently, we're not allow you to add a country or a, uh, a locality. So most of the geocodes, we don't allow you to add. So we're looking more at adding uh, local listings. So filtering by type. This is how you do it if you're using JavaScript. So when declaring the request, in addition to the location and the radius, you add a, a type array. And in this type array, you can, you can include all the types that you're interested in getting back from the Places API. So in this demo here, what I have is a, a search without any filtering. And then when I click on museum, I'm actually adding museum to the list of, the list of types that I want. Restaurant, I'm getting museums and restaurants lodging, and I can, I can use any combination of those. So that's different from listing on, on the client side, because when I remove a type, I'm actually uh, allowing some room for me to fetch more places. So say that I'm, I'm doing a search on a, on a high density area, or, or maybe a, a, a bigger radius, when you have more than actually 20 uh, local, local listings, a lot of places will be dropped from the result. But if you're interested in just in bars, then you're going to get much more bars back. And it's similar if you're using the, the web service. So you provide the types on the type parameter and use a pipe as a separator between the types. I'm just going to show you if I do a search, 
That's what I get back if I search in New York. So what I have here, this is a bit of a, a bash magic because I'm, I'm just outputting, I'm filtering, I'm running a grab and just uh, getting the types and names of, of each of the places that I get back from the Place API. So you see that I get a neighborhood store, university, lodging, establishment, restaurants. If I do the same search, but now you can see that I'm asking just for restaurants back. I get the same number of results, but now all that I get is restaurants. And if I do the same search, but now instead of restaurants, I use food. Remember the, the hierarchy that we had? So food, food is a common parent between uh, restaurants and bars. So now you see that I, in addition to restaurants, I got a grocery shop. That's because it's also a, a food establishment. So maybe I can skip this, because most of you are thinking of using the JS API, but the idea is that uh, if you're working on a native client, you probably won't be sending your request directly from the client to the Place API. You'll be proxying via your, your server. Actually, even if, you, if you're using the JS API, no, maybe not. But the idea is that your client will send the request to the server. The server will process the request, probably authenticate the user, and then translate that request into a Place API request, send, send it to the API. When it gets the response back from the API, it's, it's going to augment the, res, the, the results, adding its own content, and then send that back to, to your client. Uh, so the other reason that you do this is that you don't want your, your API key to be installed on the client for security reasons. right? So that would only exist in your server. Place details. So, um, if you remember when I told you what are the uh, attributes that come back with a search result, that's not all the data that we know about a place. So you can use the place details request to fetch more data. And we actually plan to be adding more stuff with time to the place result. And we imagine that the results are going to get longer and longer and longer. So it's not really a good idea to be stuffing all that all that data into the search result. So that demo again, I click on the listing. I'm sending a request to the API and getting the, the place details back. So how do I do this? I need, a, I need some form of ID, right, to request a place back from the API. But when we think of IDs, we're usually thinking of two, we, we have two expectations of ID, from IDs, right? The first ex expectation is that you can, re you can easily recall with an ID an entry on a, on a table, uh, an entry on a, on a database. Let's call that a recall. The other property that we expect from an ID is the ability to tell if two entries are related or the same without having to actually compare each of the, each of the roles, each of the columns in the row. We call that identity. The thing is, our index of places is not really a conventional database. It's not just places in a, in a table, right? Google is constantly uh, improving its knowledge of the world. And because of that, there's a lot of instability at the margins. So we discover new places, new places actually come into existence. Um, places may shut down or may fall off our indexes. That's what we call, uh, there's a lot of overclustering and underclustering. That means that we, there can be two different places that we 
that shows up in our index as a single one that's over clustering, or there can also be uh, a single place that shows up as two individual entries on the index that's under clustering. So they cause a lot of ID fluctuation at the margins, right? And although it's not very likely to impact the place that we really care about, that people engage with, we had to, to design our API in a way that it could, it could deal with that kind of instability. So what we did is we actually split these two concepts into two separate entities for each place. One we call reference, that's what we get recall from, and the other one we call ID, that's what you use when you want to infer identity. So you use references whenever you're referencing a place on the API. It's op optimized for recall, that it's, uh, it's very likely that it's gonna still be uh, returning the same place a year from now. But you cannot use it as a key, and I'll show you why here. So with a bit of a bash, bash magic here, I did the same requ request twice for a subway. And you see that on each request, it returned me a different reference. So if I was to use that reference to tell if that place is the same, you would conclude that no, it's not. On the other hand, we have IDs, right? IDs are used to infer identity, so to tell if two places are the same. It's optimized for stability, but it cannot be used for, as a handle. It cannot be used as a reference anywhere in the API. There's no entry point on the API that you can pass an ID to get a place back. And if you go back and I run this, the same example for IDs, you see that ID is consistent between the two requests. You're gonna see reference and IDs everywhere in the API whenever you, see, you get a place result back. You're gonna also get a, a reference and an ID. When you add a place, you get a reference and an ID. Uh, suggest gives you back references and IDs. And you can think of them as the place API ID. So how do you issue a place request on using the JS API? Again, use the place service object, and you call the get details method on it, passing a request. In this case, the request, all the request has is a reference. And I'm using the reference property on the place. The callback function takes a place and a res uh, response status. And what I'm doing the demo is just using the place to populate the attributes on, on a div. If you're using the web service, similar fashion, the endpoint is maps API place details, either JSON or XML, and the, the only parameter is reference. Just a XML output for a change. It is exactly the same structure as the, as the JSON output. It just uses a XML syntax. So as I said, the place result when it comes back from a place details has more meat. So for instance, you get a, a phone number, you get rating, you get a place page URL. You can go to the reference doc to get a full, full reference. So now we go into the, the real-time capabilities of the API. So the idea of the real-time capability is to allow you to somewhat customize the results that you get back from the, from the API. All real-time functions are restricted to your app. So whenever you do a check-in, whenever you add a place or you delete a place, you're only really impacting the results that your app gets back. 
So the reason for that is what is relevant to my application may not be relevant to your application, and also we want to protect you from uh, spammy apps. So the first feature is check-in. So what the check-in is, is an anonymous relevant signal to the API. Because the API is not uh, authenticated, so it's not end user authenticated, we have no notion of what user is actually sending the check-in to us, and we don't really care. Uh, the semantics, we don't, we don't have a, a explicit semantics to the check-in, so it's up to your app to decide what that means. If, you, if you're writing a check-in app, it's maybe your user telling your, your application, hey, I'm here. Or if you sort of more a, a recommendation kind of app, it's probably your, your user telling your, app, your application, hey, I found what I'm looking for. So it in, impacts the ranking in real time. Uh, of course, we have only the first implementation of, of real-time ranking. And as we get more data from, from actual usage, uh, we plan to improve on that, and we have a lot of ideas. So the idea is uh, eventually to be able to tell uh, you know, a coffee shop from a nightclub if they're next door to each other. Uh, during the day, you're gonna probably will be checking in into the coffee shop, and during the night, you're probably checking in into the nightclub. So the check-in is actually not available for the JS API because the JS API doesn't have a notion of an app, right? So if you want to use check-in, you're going to have to use the web service. And also, it's worth mentioning that if, you, if you're not using the web service, the check-in won't impact the results you get back from using the JS API. So because you're actually writing to, to your database, you require to use a post method instead of a get method. And what you provide in the post is the, in the, in the body of the request, is just the reference of the place you want to check into. So this is a checking request. And this is all you get back, always. So all I'm providing here is the reference of a place. XML serve, uh, the XML endpoint works the same way. And you also have to use XML syntax on the, on the body of the request. So the second real-time feature that we have is the ability to add a place. So they just to, add, to allow users and admins to add missing places on the fly. It really depends on the your policy of your app, if you're going to uh, give that functionality directly to your users, or if you're going to uh, take it on yourself to be adding the missing place as maybe user, re user report or your customers uh, claim their business into your app. It shows up into in the results immediately, and the users can engage with it straight away. So that means that if, if a user is trying to check in into, into a bar, it's, it doesn't show up in the application. He adds it into, uh, into your database. His friend right next to him can do a search straight away and will ret return in his search results, and he will be able to check in. Again, it's only available via the, the web service. The endpoint is the Maps API place add. And you provide all the data about a place in the request body. We accept name, location, accuracy of the location, and a, a single type, actually, for the place. And all, all those are required. So I'll just show you here. I'll add a taco place. So I see that I get back the response status, a reference, and an ID. So 
So I added two places. So I got a different reference and a different ID. And now I'll do a search. So because I've added at the let long one, one, there's nothing else apart from those places that I've just added. But you see, they come back straight away. Let me just add one more. There is. The same way that you can add a place, you can also d delete it from your database. So the idea is that you know, uh, if, if you allow your users to add a place, they may add spam or they may add, may add stuff that's not really relevant, relevant to your app or use abusive words. So you have the ability to remove them from your database. Again, all you need is a reference. And what I'll do here, I'll copy the reference for the pizza place. And then here to the delete request. It's deleted. I'll search. No longer shows up. If I try to delete again, it doesn't find the place as you would expect. So last but not least, we have autocomplete. So the same demo again. So I'll just call you, your attention here to the fact that it highlights the match between the user input and the create the suggestion. Also the fact that it bias bias the results, so I have to type a bit more to get back to Brazil. But if I try it from here, from the B is my first suggestion. And how do you use this? It's actually really easy. On the JS, you declare a text input field. You then, on JavaScript, get a handle to that element and pass their element in the constructor to the autocomplete object. And you're done. Actually, not quite, but you already start getting all suggestions, right? And then when the user selects a place, an event called place changed will be triggered, and you can listen to that event and maybe update the map viewport or do whatever you want with the, with the place data. So when you, when you call control.getPlace, what you get back is a, a place result, just in the same way as you got from you, you when you issued a, a get details request. So it has all the, all the information, like uh, the name, full address, a structured address, icon, so on and so forth. So, what I'm doing here with the place is I'm updating the map viewport. So all I call is uh, map.fitbounds, passing the, the place viewport. But some places do not have a viewport, so when, what I do is I use the, the location and I use the fixed zoom level. So the bounds of the autocomplete is what the bounds use to bias the suggestions. And here I'm listening to the maps bounds changed event to call control that set bounds. So it's, it couldn't be any, any easier than this.
if, you, if you're writing a native app and you also want to deploy auto-suggest, auto-complete into it, there is also a HTTP web service. It's a Maps API Place auto-complete endpoint. And it accepts two arguments. One is the partial user input and the bounds. So I have one more demo here. And it's the suggest autocomplete. Come on. So you've seen me using uh, curl on command line. So that's a really useful way to, to experiment with API. So if you sign up for the place API key, you can just uh, go any, any shell and start playing with it using curl. And you can also use, uh, if, if it's just a met, get, uh, get method, like for search or detail request, or auto-suggest, auto-complete, you can just use a browser. So if you look at what uh, auto-complete re response looks like, so it has description, which is what we sh we're showing for the user. It has a list of types. A reference, an ID, and then it has a list of terms which uh, break down the description. And then there is also a list of matched substrings. So the matched substrings is what we use to highlight where the user input matches the autocomplete suggestion. And that's not as trivial as it sounds because sometimes they don't, if you try doing it just a search, they won't match. For instance, if you search for uh, Sao Paulo, you've got some, you've got graphic, ac graphic accents on the, on the name of the city. So you don't need to type the graphic ac accent, but the suggestion does come back with an accent. So that's what I had for today. Um, the takeaways you want, to, you want you guys to, to take from here is the Place API, it's a service that provides you advanced local search services. Uh, give developers access to Google's super comprehensive and massive uh, database of places. You can access it via the web service interface or a JavaScript API. It's still in labs, which means that you know, we're constantly working to improve it and make it more useful and, and usable. So we need your feedback. Sign up, try it out, tell us what you think. And now Yoni is gonna tell you about his experience using the API. Thanks, Marcelo. Uh, my name's Yoni. I'm the lead Android developer at Scavenger, and I'm just gonna talk to you really quickly about our experiences integrating the Places API into Scavenger. Uh, first off, quick intro, what's Scavenger? Uh, Scavenger is a game that you play from your Android device or iPhone if you really insist. It's about going places, doing challenges, and earning points, badges, and even real-world rewards for playing. Uh, we were one of the larger early partners to integrate with the Places API. When we first started last year, we had five, over 500,000 users. Now we're almost at one and a half million and growing quickly. Uh, so we were outgrowing our existing solution, which was based on Geo API, which is now part of the Twitter API and then sort of killed off quietly uh, as part of that, uh, at least for public usage. Um, so we needed a solution that would scale up with us. And we also have a lot of businesses that rely on us to engage with their customers. A recent Buffalo Wild Wings campaign we ran earlier this year uh, was at 780 locations with 180,000 players completing uh, over 1.2 million challenges. 
Uh, so we needed a solution that could scale up to that sort of size and have the, the accuracy to, to work with a good list of places to go, go forward with. So we turned to Google and the Places API for that. So what's it really like getting started? The answer is today, actually really easy. Uh, as Marcella showed you, really all you need is curl and an API key and you can get going. Almost all the data you need to get started building, building a location-based app, you can get from just one or two of those uh, API endpoints. So that's really great, uh, especially if you're getting started today, it'll be really easy for you. Uh, there are a few little gotchas, uh, things that you might run across, particularly as you get ready to actually ship your app into the real world. Uh, the ID versus references difference that Marcelo covered is one of those things, so be aware of that. Uh, and also, uh, there is a request, an API request limit. Uh, it's 1,000 by default uh, per day. Uh, so before you launch your hot stealth mode startup out into the world, uh, make sure you authenticate yourself to get bumped up to 100,000 a day, uh, which is very easy to do, doesn't cost any money, and uh, will definitely save you some headaches if, uh, that you would have if you forgot to do that. Uh, and also attributions, particularly uh, the Places database has really good data for especially non-US locations where a lot of other services fall flat, uh, but they do have a bit of data that comes back called attributions uh, that you have to show your users, uh, which is where that data is sourced from. Uh, so that also applies to mobile clients, so don't be stuck scrambling to update your iPhone and Android clients last minute before launch with that. Uh, be aware of that from the outset. Uh, but those are really little things. Uh, the bottom line is what, what happens when you move to the Places API. Uh, for us, it was a win all around. Uh, uncached place listing requests, what are the places near me? Uh, for us, sped up about three times, mostly because we were able to replace a lot of areas where we had to make multiple API calls to remote services with just one call to the Places API, which was great. Uh, the data is a lot more complete. We found that users, the ratio of users adding places versus visits went down by about 40%, meaning that users were just finding the places they were looking for more often without having to go through the kind of painful manual process of typing in a place from scratch, uh, which is really good for, uh, especially for mobile applications. Uh, and finally, and probably hardest to quantify, uh, the data is just cleaner. We have a lot less of a problem with junk data, duplicate places, old places that aren't around anymore, and uh, we don't have to go through a process we used to have to go through to remove spam places, especially spam locksmiths for some reason uh, that were in a lot of our other data sets. So that was great. Uh, and I'll leave you with just a, a few of the features that are new to the API uh, versus what was there last year that I'm most excited about as a developer. Uh, first of all, that check-ins matter now. When you post a check-in back to the places API, that's used for adjusting the rankings of those places short term. So if we're running a promotion, for example, uh, with Toscanini's, an ice cream shop in Cambridge, uh, Toscanini's will rise up in the rankings while that promotion or that event is going on with no manual intervention necessary on our part just because our users are checking in there. Uh, and then once they're done, uh, once that event is over, Toscanini's will fall back to its normal ranking, although probably not quite that because it'll inherently be more popular uh, because of our event there. Uh, and the second thing I'm pretty excited about is instant place ads. With most other place APIs, uh, and the old way it worked on the uh, Google Places API, if, you, if your users reported a new place that was missing from the database, you'd have to either tell that user that they couldn't do anything there until it's approved, or you'd have to keep a local copy of that place and merge it with the data coming back from the remote API. And then once it got approved on the remote end, you'd have to go through some sort of deduplication process and move all the activity over to the new place. You don't have to do that anymore. The results come back to your app now instantly, and uh, eventually they'll get approved for everybody else using the APIs, which is really nice. It means a lot less bookkeeping for you. Uh, and the bottom line is, by moving to the Places API, uh, we've improved the experience for our end users, for our business clients, and it's made life easier for us as developers. And at the end of the day, it means everybody can spend less time tweaking lists of locations and more time playing. And really, that's what it's all about. Uh, and on that note, I'll pass things back to Marcelo, and we'll open the floor up to Q&A. Question about the uh, the ratings and reviews that uh, I see when I go to the the uh, maps.google.com you know places places details result. Uh, is there any 
plans to integrate that into the into the service or you know in the more detailed like aggregate reviews of, of, from other places and yeah there is that's yeah. that's in our, our roadmap definitely is a sign up required for the JavaScript API and when you do an add through the web service API is that added site essentially stored underneath your key so there's no sign up for the JS API and you, I don't know if I understood your question, but there's no add from the JS API. Right, but when you use the web service and you add something, I've added it, is it cluttering up his results? No. So it's stored underneath my key, yep. that's how it's... Exactly. Thank you. So I just wanted to be clear, I think you kind of addressed this, but the reference that comes back is different every time you call the API, even with the same client ID. And you mentioned that there are times when uh, there might be duplicates, right? Like it's been under clustered. What happens if those two entities get merged? So both references will now fetch the merged place. Okay. I was uh, trying out the autocomplete uh, feature and I noticed that there's geocoding that's put into it so you can actually look up addresses as well as just place names. Uh, one thing I was having some trouble with though is that I have a uh, I have a service which uh, has food trucks as a, as a major user of it, and they always want to use intersections. And I didn't see that there was any support for intersections at current. Are there plans for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a really interesting idea. OK. No, there's, uh, how, how would you look for an intersection? Maybe Tor. OK, because right now, when, when I use the, uh, the geocode, uh, the geocoder it has a great uh, feature where you just type in Fifth and Mission, you know, and it'll turn it to you know Mission uh, Mission Avenue and Fifth Street, San Francisco, yeah. California. There's one of the options, but that yeah, doesn't seem to be that. I think um, one of the one of the things I I kind of expect and accept we were going we were going to have to say a lot <laughs> <laughs> over the next year is it's important to understand that the autocomplete service is not a geocoder. It's not, that it's not designed or intended to be used as a geocoder. It is designed to be used to, to complete queries and to find um, individual places by their name. Um, now, in the case of an address object, their name is the address. So you can, for example, search for, um, uh, you, could, so you could enter the name of a street and you could enter the name of the city, and even if those two things are not next to each other in the address, we would match it for autocomplete. That would work. Um, but the geocoder, can, the geocoder service, the official one, can do other more smart things where its whole purpose in life is to try and give you back a lat long for the query you've given us. And so it will take that query and it will try and split it and, and you know, decompose it and do analysis on it to try and um, infer as much meaning as possible from that query in order to give you back a lat long. You'll notice that the autocomplete service does not give you back a lat long by design. It gives you back a reference which you can use to get a lat long if you really want one. Mm -hmm. But we actually we don't want to encourage its use as an alternate geocoder. In fact, if there are reasons why you're finding you're getting more success in searching for places in autocomplete than you do in the geocoder, then we consider that to be a bug in the geocoder and we'd like to know about it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, by the way, is there any way to supplement the autocomplete? Um, what, with your own list of? With some other with some other uh, API. So you could, you could do that if you're using the, the, the web service, right? Because mm -hmm. you're getting the re result back. Uh, but we do have plans to allow you to extend how, both how the control that I just show you work, and also to provide you uh, a service inside the JS API. So you could call autocomplete with a request and then get back uh, a list of results instead of inject that into, into a, a div. Okay, thank you. Yeah, also, Hi, I'll, I'll, I, take, I'll just take this opportunity to say that we, we prioritize the, the sort of, um, the control we have at the moment, or at least the, the feature we have in the moment, the JS API, where we actually implement the drop down for you. And we wanted to make it easy as possible because we want every single field on the web which asks someone for an address to implement autocomplete because the world will be better for it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Klaus. I got a question. Who is actually meant to add or delete the new locations? Is that the user of the application or, or who does it? It really depends on your app. 
right? That's a, a so we could give app specific policy. You could give that power to your to user, user if okay. you trust them to, to do the right thing or that, you know, crowdsourcing it, or you could do it, like have admin people doing it for you. Okay, thank you. I think a, a particularly interesting question on that topic is how do you handle deletes? Yeah. Um, I think many apps do allow users to add places and they just assume that that place is, is good and, that, and they publish it immediately. But for deletes, you could, for example, say, if five people trigger, signal to us that, if five of our users signal to us that this place is bad, we'll delete it, um, just to avoid someone just going and deleting everything. So I, again, this is probably a stupid question, but so there are no rate limits on the JavaScript version of the API? There are um, rate limits, although we don't publish them um, because uh, we don't want to encourage people to, to, to push them uh, and because we need the freedom to, to, to change them or vary them. Um, so there are rate limits that apply per, per map session. Um, there are no um, daily limits. There are no because that, that doesn't really apply to maps that appear within web pages where you could have multiple tabs with different pages open and so forth. So a mapping session is some combination of IP and source URL and all these things? Um, a map session is one single load of the Maps API, regardless of how much activity then follows. Okay. Um, so within that, there are, there are rate limits that apply, but they say they're not, they're not documented. All right, one more question. Uh, is there a way to get user-specific check-ins uh, so that I can prioritize the places that a user themselves has checked in over just general every place in my app? No, so as I said, we don't know who the user is because the user is okay. not authenticated with us. And there's no way to, for you to tell us. Okay. So currently, no. Okay. It's something that, we could, um, that we've considered and that we could implement in future. Um, there are some interesting questions around privacy that come into play at that point when we have an explicit end user. But in fact, the, the questions become a lot more complicated if we just have a signal as the user rather than actually, for example, a Google account. At least with a Google account, we can provide them with tools to manage the data that we've stored and to delete the data that we've stored. But if you're just giving us some opaque identifier, mm. um, we have information stored about users and we can't provide them with any way to manage that data, which isn't good. Thank you. Uh, is, there, is there a limit on the, uh, the, the radius? So, for example, if we want to search you know, within 30 miles of, in a city? So we're actually working on this at the moment, and there probably will be. Okay, but, uh, but so right now, it's, uh, there's nothing. You can, you can assume that there is. And, <laughs> yeah. And it's, we're still trying, trying to nail down a number. Yeah. I mean, bear in mind that you only ever get 20 results, right? Um, so the broader you search, um, you're essentially, um, because of the way the ranking algorithm works, particularly in the absence of any check-ins, um, we give you the top 20 places in that area. And so uh, as that area gets bigger and bigger, um, you're going to end up with just really, really, really major landmarks. Like Empire State Building yeah. and um, Statue of Liberty. Uh, one more thing, um, with regards to caching the information, do you guys have any, uh, any, any terms on that, like what we cannot do? We don't have terms that are specific to the Places API, um, but the Maps API Terms of Service, which the Places API falls under, um, have a language around um, rights to cache that, that basically say that you can cache um, reasonable quantities, small quantities of data um, for performance reasons. And the reference and IDs, you're allowed to store uh, for as long as you like. Um, and you can always use those to refresh cache data as well. Um, the, the, important th the most important things there are um, that uh, you need to only use the data in conjunction with, the app with a, a Maps API Place API application. You can't use it outside of an application. Um, and if at any point you choose to s stop using, you know, stop um, offering this application or switch to a different different uh, source of places data, then you have to dispose of the data that you've cached. So, so stuff that I add using my add key, is that available only to my application or will that be available to everybody? No, it's only available to your application, only uh -huh. to that specific key. Until, until it's moderated. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, when you add something, um, it immediately turns up in, in your subsequent search results, but it, is gets, it, it does also get passed into Google's moderation pipeline for new places, the same one that's used on Google Maps when you report a new place. Um, if uh, it, it gets successfully moderated, 
um, then it will go into Google's main index and be visible across all of Google's properties and to other places' API applications. If it does not get successfully moderated, it will still continue to be available to your application. And how long does it take for it to moderate? Um, that varies. Um, it's of the order of weeks. Okay. And I understand I need to use the app key when I add stuff to it, but I can, I can query it using the JavaScript without the key? You can you can query. You don't need a Places API key to use the JavaScript, but the place the JavaScript API will not return app specific places. In other words, places that have not yet been moderated. So all all the real time features, uh, you don't get them when you use the, J, the JS API. Okay, so there's no and way to add the key to the JavaScript API. No, the the, the problem is that um, because all JavaScript applications are by definition. Um, publicly visible, I can just hit view source and, and wade through, then I could find your key very easily and, and just hammer it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we didn't want to allow that. Cool, thanks. Uh, how are you guys doing? Um, my question's on um, ID, place ID or reference ID facets. Have you given thought to, for example, um, other facets of uh, spatial locations? One might be temporal. For example, the definition of a spatial location may change over time, whether or not you're going to be storing that, first part. Second is, um, how immutable are these IDs? You said earlier, for instance, uh, two reference IDs might get merged and point to one specific location. So it sounds to me like if you're issuing an ID or a reference ID that someone else then receives, then it's more or less guaranteed to always resolve to something once a query is made with that ID. Mm -hmm. And then also the caching question, I just wanted to reiterate on the caching, um, you're not the only place provider. So you know there are other people who are doing IDs. So how kosher is doing like a, an, a global placing map between your service and other services? OK, so I think there are three questions there. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me see if I can remember them. Um, Right. So facets with the so, support. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So as far as facets are concerned, um, you know, it, it's a good point that, uh, and something I mentioned in, in the session yesterday is that places is a very fuzzy and broad concept. Um, we as people, um, you know, we can define places in all sorts of ways, and some of them could be personal. I can say my house. I can say the place I got married. Um, some of them can be relative. You know, I can say, ah, oh, that coffee shop opposite the, you know, the, the hardware store. Um, and, and some of them can be um, completely transient, um, you know, like a, a state fair. Um, some of them can be um, in motion, such as flights, for example. You know, I'm on QF73 or whatever. Um, and these are all use cases which, uh, you know, ideally we'd like to be able to support well in the long term. For the time being, we've taken a position that a, um, a, a single place is a, um, an object with a fixed location and a fixed name. Um, so, for the time being, we don't support things like, uh, you know, I say, moving objects. Um, I think temporal awareness is very important. There's no doubt that people like to check into events, for example, as well as into places. It's much more interesting to tell your friends that you're at the Lady Gaga concert than that you're at the HP Pavilion, for example. So, um, event support is something that is absolutely on the roadmap, not necessarily as um, as a new type of place, but as a property of an existing place. That's the more likely model. OK. Second question was? Uh, the uh, uh, immutable nature right. of your okay. ID's identification scheme. So um, the, uh, the, the goal of the Places API reference is that a Places API reference for any given place should continue to always return that place for as long as that place continues to exist. Um, so clearly, place businesses close. And what we don't currently support is the ability to retrieve information about a place after it's no longer in the index. Um, we realize that may actually be important. Um, you know, your check-in history ultimately may span years and years, and you don't want to lose those, th that context. So that's something that we'll, you know, we're going to have to consider. Um, but right now, you know, as long as that business continues to exist, we'll, we will we'll match it. And the way we do that is that we, that the, the whole reason why we have a separate reference is because the references you will see are significantly longer. And although they appear to be garbage, it's actually effectively an encrypted search that gives us a way of falling back through different 
means of matching in the case of drift of attributes that we rely on for that purpose. Um, and the last was caching and um, oh, creating a matching. Map right. So um, we're definitely very aware, and this is well, this is one of the great pieces of feedback that came out of the developer preview. It really shows the value of it because it wasn't something that we picked up on at first. Is that something that's very extremely valuable to these location-based app developers is what they call distribution, the ability to um, make people aware of their app in a crowded market space of hundreds of thousands of iPhone and Android applications. Um, Awareness is, is key. Now, one of the main ways in which applications rely on this kind of awareness right now is, is, through, is through social networks. Is If I download an app and use it and then do a check-in, that check-in gets written to my Twitter stream or to my Facebook page. And in doing so, my friends see that um, and, and, uh, and may choose to, to, to join the party, as it were. So it's important that in those cases, you can write your, this, your check-ins across these services. So uh, we do actually have language in the terms of service that address this. and. Um, the basic rule of thumb is that uh, if I do a check-in using an app that's based on the Places API, I pull back uh, a set of information about that place. Um, what I can do is take, say, the location of that place and then do a search on a third-party API and attempt to match those things client-side. Oh, sorry, I mean, like, developer-side, if you like, in your infrastructure. Um, in order to find the ID, that's perfectly fine. What we ask that you don't do is... Um, submit uh, data that you've received from our API to those services, right? So that means two things. It means um, I get a lat long from the user's phone, I do a search on the place API, I come back with a set of places, I present them with one, they choose one, great. I then do a similar lat long based search on the, uh, some other API, they give me back a set of places, I match them, great. What you can't do is take the place name and use it as a search query over here, right? Um, similarly, you can't say, oh, they don't have that place. I'm going to create it using the data I got from Google. Fair, fair, <laughs> fair. Okay, um, but we're out, we're out of time. Out of time. Okay, okay so, thank you. I, I'm happy to chat more afterwards if, if that would be useful.